Half past. 29, we'll give it a minute. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll, um, we'll make a start. So it's quite interesting how many of you have come back and how many of you were here early in this morning. Obviously, you never heard me last year, but you'll be pleased to know I'm not presenting, so that's obviously why you came back. Um, so we're going to uh, go into a session now, which I think you know will really hit home. Um, back in the UK, there's been a significant incident as people know over the last couple of days um, and although we're all in, the, in our jobs and our roles to help people uh, I think the reality is, is we just don't know what we're going into and we're going to work so we've got three outstanding speakers um, and what we'll do is we'll go through the sessions and hopefully have some time for some meaning conversation at the end so I'll introduce YY from Singapore who's the Chief Medical Officer for the Defence League and he's going to introduce our first two speakers as we move forward into this morning's session. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm impressed that so many of you are still here and still up after last night. <laughs> so that is impressive in itself. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Bob Winter. Um, Bob is actually the medical director of the East Midland Ambulance Service. Um, for those of you who heard him speak yesterday about how his paramedics can do pre-hospital sepsis identification uh, antibiotics before they reach the hospital, Bob has a lot of experience uh, dealing with uh, critical care. He's also um, the medical lead for the major trauma network there. And he is uh, the national clinical director for emergency preparedness and critical care. So... Let me introduce to you Bob, and he'll tell you more himself. Thanks, Bob. Cheers. Okay, um, so actually, because of what's happened in Manchester, uh, clearly I couldn't prepare my talk uh, to cover that. So some of the slides I'm not going to use, and some of the slides I'm going to skip over, if that's okay. Okay. The first thing I'd say, if you're preparing for mass casualties, we have a program in the UK called JESSIP, Joint Emergency Services Interoperability uh, Protocol. And what that means is that all three emergency services, the fire and rescue, the police, and uh, the EMS, we all use the same language. Um, so before, when we declared major incidents, uh, health used methane, uh, police used chalet, and fire and rescue used sad chalet. Um, so now we all use methane, so we won, and that's important for, to me. The first thing I'd also say about major incidents is that um, the most important thing is parking. It's just like going to a hospital. Um, EMS turns up, we have clear lines of channels, we have an ambulance loading pay, we, have, we know where the ingress points are, we know where the egress points are, and then fire and rescue turn up with thousands of shiny red trucks and park them all over the place, and it's a disaster. So... Terrorism. We've had recent attacks in Paris and Brussels, and we have to realize that the terrorists are getting more intelligent uh, and they are more targeted. So not only do we have a changing threat profile with multiple locations, military assault weapons in Paris and Mumbai, 
combination with IEDs, but they're getting more intelligent about how they plan the attacks. So, Brussels, the first bomb blast, check-in desk for American Airlines. Subsequent bomb blasts on the exits. So you get one blast that shepherds people towards the second blast. The terror attack in Manchester, waited until the concert had ended, and all of the people were leaving through a congested foyer. Maximum impact. In London, we used to have these blue triangles near all the major transport hubs with the words RVP on them, which stood for rendezvous point, which is where the emergency services were to assemble in the event of an incident in one of the transport hubs. You go to London now, for, for some no bizarre reason, those have all gone. Because we know that a target for terrorists is to target the emergency services, because the purpose of terrorism is to create terror. In, in the UK, we were quite a little bit complacent about the threat from assault weapons until Nice. Because it's quite hard to get an assault weapon into the UK, because we're an island. Sadly, in two years, we'll be even more of a bloody island, but never mind, we won't go there. Um, but it's not that difficult to steal a lorry. Things to think about from the Whitehall attack a couple of months ago was, well, the, the sad fact is the guy actually ordered a Suzuki Swift. An enterprise car hire in Birmingham gave him a free upgrade to a 4x4, and that is true. He also didn't sign the collision waiver, but uh, hey-ho. The, th the thing to think about with this is the speed of the attack. This attack took 82 seconds start to finish. This is a vehicle-based attack. The second thing to think about is communication. London Ambulance thought they were going to a single vehicle RTC. So they sent one response. Also, communication from the scene to the hospitals was shoddy. Now, part of that was because London Ambulance stood up two of their major trauma centres, one north of the bridge and one south of the bridge, as a major incident standby. The hospitals took major incident standby to mean there is a major incident. In fact, King's, which got most of the, the patients, only got eight patients. So they, they got less than Chris Moran, who's the National Clinical Director for Trauma, and I received at the hospital where we work um, from the local motorsport circuit that weekend. But, the, and the other two, two major trauma centres in London heard about it on Twitter and on Sky. And so they put themselves on major incident standby. So just about 200 operations got cancelled over London for absolutely no reason. And that was just because London Ambulance didn't communicate with the hospitals. The other issue with London was there were five different police forces. Because you had the Whitehall Police, you had the City of London Police, you had the Metropolitan Police, you had SO5, who are our counter-terrorism police, and they're the ones with the sunglasses, that's how you can spot those. And then we had British Transport Police, because they always turn up. The other thing that's worth thinking about is the, the uh, because as you know, most police in the UK aren't armed, it was actually the terrorists were shot by a close protection officer for Michael Fallon, who's one of the, our government ministers, who hit him with a single 9mm hollow round uh, shot from 15 yards, moving target, centre of the chest. Which leads me to believe that this person might have, is, wasn't the police and might have previously abseiled down the side of the Iranian embassy. Um, Manchester. 22 people killed. Of the survivors, large numbers of them, their, pr their principal wounds are embedded shrapnel because the, uh, the suicide bomber had packed his suicide vest with nuts and bolts. Uh, also, significant numbers of the casualties, of whom 22 still remain in hospital, 16 in intensive care, despite what you read in the press, have got embedded body parts, either from the suicide bomber himself or from other victims who were killed and injured. Only three have got blast lung. You might think, you, know, you might need a, what, what a sophisticated uh, operation to build a bomb that powerful. Um, who's here from Denmark? How far is the nearest pharmacy? 
How, how far to walk? 500 meters. 500 meters. So in about two and a half hours, I could go to that pharmacist and buy the chemicals required to make what that terrorist used, we think, which was a substance known as TATP, which is triacetone triperoxide, which is easy to make. Now, if I was being devious, I'd buy it from two pharmacies, so they didn't know what I was up to. But it's, it is that straightforward. And um, ammonium nitrate fuel oil is even easier to make into a bomb. OK, triage. I'm going to skip over this merely to say that it's rubbish. Now, I'll come to why it's rubbish in a second, and also why, much as I hate to admit it, and thank God Pierre Carly isn't here to hear me say it, the French system for casualty triage distribution is better than ours. And, and I'll show you why that is and why we should be doing it wrong. So sieve and sort, which we tend to do in the field and at casualty clearing, they are physiological systems of triage. Yeah? They are great for what they are, but they are very sensitive, not very specific. And they don't categorize you by type of injury. They are very good because they can be taught to anyone. You can teach a firefighter to do this. You can teach the police to do this. Anatomic is better, more accurate, but it's difficult. The other thing I'd point out to you as EMS providers is the impact of siege. Of the, of the victims of the Bataclan um, siege, because it took about an hour and a half to get inside the theater, all of the patients with truncal or head wounds died. All of the victims were peripheral wounding, limbs, essentially. Everybody else died, because in the time it took them to get in, they bled out. Fairly straightforward. Um, so that's, that's worth thinking about. So triage sieve, then, very straightforward. Surprisingly large numbers of people end up as P1 and P2. The only thing I always say to people about smart tag is if you're in a situation where they are using expectant, i.e. leave this casualty and come back, the most important thing you need to know as an EMS provider if you're involved is if you look down and see blue, refold it so it's red. Because you're more likely to get a response. Triage saw, again, large numbers will end up as P1. Now, the difference in response between the Paris and most of the rest of the UK, of, of Euro, a lot of the Europe who use a sort of British model of, of paramedicine, a lot of you have doctors on board. Paris, they have the doctors embedded in the command structure of the ambulance service because the ambulance service is a military unit and has been since the time of Napoleon because Napoleon didn't want um, to leave Paris without a military unit, so the fire brigade and military. So one day they might be guarding the Louvre, and the next day they might be putting out fires, the next day they might be in an ambulance. They employ 60 doctors. And what's important is those 60 doctors are embedded in the command structure. Their concept of operations is that they have, uh, they have the Raid Médecin, who are the um, doctors who go into the hot zone with the armed specialist um, response officers, from the police, and their job is to resuscitate the police. Yeah? So they, in theory, they ignore everybody else. So they go forward into the hot zone. I, d I don't know about you, but personally, I know several doctors that I would nominate for that role. I wouldn't necessarily give them ballistic armor. But. Then they have um, EMS officers from the fire brigade, and the fire brigade decide on casualty distribution. And that is important because uh, there were no secondary transfers required from the um, Paris um, terror attack. Now, pa the Paris was lucky for a number of reasons. They were lucky because it happened at 5, 6 o'clock on a, on a Friday afternoon, and Paris is a bit like London, unlike where I work, where people leave work and they go for a drink or a meal or whatever nearby to their place of work. They had loads of off-duty staff. They'd had a doctor's strike that day, so they had 250 empty ICU beds. Paris has 47 hospitals that can take major trauma. London has four. Um, I checked, because I, I can do this, uh, and on the t at the time of the Paris attack, the United Kingdom had three empty intensive care beds. That's in the whole country. We had three empty beds, because we run that hot. Um, their casualty distribution was done by um, the French Fire Brigade, uh, using the SAMU ambulances from the hospitals. All the, everyone was distributed. 
they use a, they have a sort of a, a plan camembert, so they just distributed it in a wedge, radiating, radiating away from the incident. So the rest of Paris continued business as usual. Unlike London, where 22 casualties cancelled 200 operations. So that's their operational document. I'll skip over that. This is the UK, um, and um, we have a similar system. The out outside perimeter controlled by the police. Interesting fact, there has never been a major incident in the UK without at least one bogus healthcare professional. Somebody pretending to be a doctor. Okay. Why is, the, why is the lessons from Paris about casualty distribution important? Well, we ran an exercise uh, using a, a system called Emergo Train, and um, Michael Molmer, who's a former colleague of mine, is talking about training, uh, training for disasters uh, in a bit, but somewhere else. But this was our scenario. Similar numbers of casualties. We used the normal method of casualty distribution that we would use in the UK, which is essentially an ambulance incident officer and an ambulance loading officer deciding which casualties go where. This is the East Midlands. Um, the is, is there a so um, this is Leicester. That's Leicester Royal Infirmary. It's a big hospital, but it's not a major trauma centre. Our major trauma centres in the East Midlands are Queen's Medical Centre up here, where I do my clinical stuff and University of Coventry and Warwick here. We've got, these two hospitals are tiny, Kings Mill and Chesterfield, and Derby Royal Hospital is, again, big, but it's not a major trauma centre, can't do head injuries. Interesting things, we released ambulances into this exercise as they became free on the CAD. So that as ambulances actually became available in real life, we released them into the exercise. Why is that important? Because unlike a lot of other exercises that Emergo Train run, we, we found that we weren't getting significant numbers of P1 casualties removed from scene until well into an hour after the exercise had started. So the implications of that is, as EMS providers, we have to be providing extended care in the field for several hours in the casualty collection point. And that would fit with the experience of the Bataclan, even though that was a slightly different in that it was a siege. And our P2 casualties didn't even start leaving the scene until three hours after the exercise had started. So that's one learning point. The second learning point is our casualties ended up all over the place. So they ended up, so these two, so a significant number of the P1 casualties ended up in the major trauma centers significant numbers in the big teaching hospitals that aren't major trauma centres, but we had 14 P1 casualties that ended up in hospitals that can best be described as a shed. <laughs> now, we asked the clinicians in all the non-major trauma centres to estimate how many of the casualties that they received would have died purely as a consequence of arriving in the wrong hospital. And... Uh, Derby reckoned five of their 17 P1s would have died because they were primarily neurotrauma. Leicester reckoned four. Kings Mill were probably quite rightly harsh on themselves, and they said all of them. But in total, we reckon 20 of our casualties died, would have died a preventable death purely on the basis of inadequate casualty distribution. So, what are we going to do about it? So in the UK, it's one of the, the EPRR bit of my job is the only bit of my job in the UK that's got any money attached to it. I just go and whisper in a minister's ear, terrorist, have some cash. Unlike the rest of the NHS. Um, so we are, we're now going to prescribe to the ambulance services in England three levels of medical support that they must provide. And you say, why medical? Well, medical, because we want these people to come and know the local hospital system's capabilities, because we can't guarantee that of all our ambulance incident commanders, that they will know what the wider picture outside of their particular operating patch is. They're all advisory posts, because unlike a lot of countries, we, uh, my ambulance service only employs three doctors, and I'm, I'm one of them. Um, a strategic medical advisor, a tactical medical advisor, and the most important, probably the most important role, the casualty clearing medical lead. 
So the strategic medical advisor, uh, into the ambulance EOC, strategic view of what's going on, overview of capacity locally and wider, liaising with neighbouring ambulance um, providers to th talk about their capacity, and advice to the ambulance strategic commander. Now, that, this is my role, strategic medical advisor, for a number of reasons. One is I have an overview of the ambulance service. Two is I'm not going to get blown up or shot. And three is they have coffee. The tactical medical advisor, advisory role, so our ambulance incident commanders have two advisors. They have what's known as a TAC advisor, who's from our um, hazardous area response teams, and uh, a, a medical advisor. This is probably the least important role. Yeah, because it's, it's not a command role and it's just giving an overview of the scene and what the likely hazards are likely to be. And in fact, the hazardous area response team, I've got a much better idea. The casualty clearing centre doctor is likely to be the most important role because he is the one who is deciding on casualty distribution, liaising with EOC and the strategic medical advisor to say, OK, what is the capacity of my local major trauma centre? If my local major trauma centre is now becoming full, where is my next major trauma centre? So we get it right first time, kind of shadowing that what the French managed to do, but also recognising that this person is going to be supervising either enhanced care teams, what we call basics doctors, or paramedics, providing enhanced care in the field for a prolonged time. And there's various options about how you, how you do this. We've, we've actually locally, because King's Mill have said, we can't take major trauma, you know, we're a perfectly good little emergency department, so we're going to just write them out of our major incident plan regionally and just say, OK, in the event of a major incident, we're not taking you anything, but we are kidnapping your emergency department and you're coming to run casualty clearing. And so we, we give them some money, and they've agreed to do that. Other ambulance services, so Yorkshire, just north of us, have got rotors of, of various doctors. Air assets, imp vitally important. What the exercise showed us was we misused them in major incidents. So we were using air assets in the, a in the, accident, in the incident to transfer patients to Coventry and Warwick, which shaved 15 minutes off the journey. Whereas we could have been using them to go to Leeds, to go to Sheffield, to go further afield. So what we're doing now is we have what's known as the National Ambulance Resilience Unit, and we pay them an on-call rotor. And until now, I had no idea why we bothered, to be honest. But now, uh, they will form an ambulance coordination cell, and they will coordinate our air ambulance assets and allow for wider distribution. OK. Questions? Or are we going to do questions at the end, Paul? Yeah, I, li I like this 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 tag because you'll you'll notice that there's a a mythical um, triage category: no pulse, walking, uh, no pulse or breathing, walking, crawling, and moving towards you. Um, and so I gave a similar version of this talk at the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. So you know, big, about two thousand people, and I asked for questions. And then this bloke in the audience, who is a cardiac anaesthetist at one of the Nottingham hospitals, who's now not speaking to my wife because she works in the same hospital, said, put his hand up and said, you haven't told us what to do about the zombies. So I stood there waiting for the punchline. And this is, you know, that awful silence that moves away from people that have said something really <laughs> stupid. And I realised it was a serious question. So I just said, uh, in the films, you have to destroy the brain or cut the head off. <laughs> and now he's not speaking to my wife. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you, Bob, for sharing with us uh, what you do. Um, the next speaker really needs no introduction. AJ Heitman has been well known by many of us in EMS, and for those of you who've read uh, Gems or vis visited the Gems conference or EMS Today. AJ is always an ever presence in all these meetings. Um, even today, as I was just uh, flipping through my phone, I realized that he's already um, sort of reported on the conference itself. And there's a whole list of things that he's uh, talked about on the last couple of days of events. And today, AJ is going to talk to us about safety of EMS crew uh, at scene. But I think he's going to expand given uh, what's been going on the last couple of days with the Manchester incidents as well as some other events, right? Yes, AJ? sir. 
Okay, so without much further ado, AJ, thank you. Hi, gang. Okay, so those who've heard me speak, I'm very visual, I'm very fast, because you're going to get the slide set. So I'm going to hit you on things that I think we need to throw into our cranium and, uh, and understand. First of all, soft targets. It can be anything as a soft target. We've seen it from trucks, etc. cetera. Um, the Manchester situation was handled very well, but there's some things that we can learn from their incident that should go in our brain. We should get this book, Tear at Beslin. You can only get it at that website. It talks about how terrorists went into Beslin in Russia and they decided to pick a soft target, which is a school, a soft target which has younger kids so they can't fight. They chained all the doors. They used the adults on the first day of September in Russia. Everybody brings their kids to school. So they had captive audience. They had adults that they could have help them fortify and then they killed. And then they secured children to uh, basketball posts with bombs and said, if any of you move, or if any of your parents move, you're going to die. And what began to happen is that the townspeople heard that the school was under siege, and they started shooting at the school. And then the military and the police could not get close, and EMS could not get close. And so it was an obstacle, and in the end, there were hundreds of killed, children that were killed. And there's two very important chapters in that book at the end that tell how it can happen in your country, how you can take control of a school, and that's the lesson that I'd like you to learn. Um, but in Manchester, as well as other places, we learned that we have a lot of ambulatory patients. They help you with triage. You just have to understand they're going to be waved away from the scene, and you're going to have to encounter them further away. So they're certainly not going to be your first priority patients, but they're going to need care. And the use of things like aluminized blankets all throughout Europe is a fabulous thing to have because we're not going to tend to some of these patients for a while, the minor injuries, and we've got to keep them warm, keep them from shock. So this is ambulatory but injured, ABI. These are semi-ambulatory but injured. So the ones that can run, they're going to run. They're going to often end up in the emergency department um, before your ambulance can take them there. So you see a pattern that happens in these things. Lessons from Paris. Nightclub shooting, extended shooting, EMS is not inside. When they do go inside, they're in a warm zone. We'll talk about that. Um, the use of the F Paris Fire Brigade as patient carriers is extremely important. Don't tie up your paramedics carrying patients. Use your fire brigade, your fire services to have patient transfer teams. Bring a patient, get another patient, bring a patient. Don't tie up your medical responders to do that. Paris has resource trucks, which we should all have, but they have smaller trucks as well that bring cases that everybody's familiar with that bring caches of equipment to patient treatment areas and extra suction units. So when those kits are opened and dropped at a treatment area, People understand that they have extra supplies in there. Now, when I was there recently, one of the things that they learned from the Barclavon and other incidents is it's nice to have a truck come, but your first in ambulances also have to have some supplies. Because in the day of terrorism, you don't have time to wait for a truck of supplies. So what they have in all the SAMU units now, which they learned after the last incident, is this big red bag fastened against the wall and inside it are sub bags, if you will, that they can throw to people that have tourniquets, chest seals, wound clot dressings. And this is significant because in the US, we had a congresswoman who was shot. And EMS could not get into that scene because it was still hot. The guy was still shooting. Now, the Pima, Arizona police have little bags behind the headrest of their car. They sold them on that that you as an officer should have tourniquets, wound clot dressings, sucking chest wool dressings to help you and your partner. But if you get to a shooting like this, you can each grab that from behind your headrest and make an impact, an impact they did. 10 of the 12 critical patients lived because of those small packs. 
Okay, so it's not just for police, but it's a good way to sell the police. I'm gonna help you first, and you can help others second. Everything has to be visible. Each of these MCI kits that I've done for services, that's an airway bag, four of everything, because you can plop that down with 402 bottles and set up multiple uh, ventilations for these patients. This is a simple plastic shotgun case that we affix Velcro to, you lay it open in a treatment area, everything's visible, go shopping. There's a lot of things on the market now. People have terrorism kits with multiple tourniquets. The key that I'm showing you here is that everything has to be visible. Everything's visible. Everything's visible. What I liked recently that I saw was this bag because it's kind of on the, the uh, variety of what Paris is using, that when you open that, you can throw those individual bags to people and, and it all has standard equipment in it. There's even a bag on the market now that is ballistic. So if you're in a treatment area and somebody starts shooting or a ricochet, I'll talk about protection of the rescuers. Our Boston bombing showed us that, as others have talked about, there'll be multiple bombs and they'll try and kill responders. But what these multiple bombs tell you is that they're extremely, extremely destructive. These were pressure cooker bombs, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And a pressure cooker bomb will explode, and as we saw in Manchester, things travel at ground level. The main concussion will kill people. It's the secondary concussion and uh, debris that also affects people. That's a standard pressure cooker. And the concept of the terrorist is to fill it with nails, BBs, other objects. Very simple to make. And with the detonation of a pressure cooker, which is designed to hold pressure inside, when that heat is generated, that heat will begin to travel and expand, and shrapnel will go up to 1,000 feet per second. Very easy to make. Something we have to be aware of. And those BBs, as we talked about, the shrapnel that we saw in, uh, in Manchester the other day, can fly 1,000 feet, cause these kind of injuries. You're going to need to do chest decompressions. You're going to need wound clot dressing. You're going to need multiple adhesive dressings for sucking chest wounds. If you're not carrying three and a quarter inch needles, we've shown in cadaver labs that you're not going to be able to decompress some of the morbidly obese patients and bigger patients. Blast injuries again, facial injuries, primary, secondary. You're going to have these kind of injuries you have to be prepared for. You're going to have inhalation burns. And the pressure wave from the explosion, number one, the explosion is going to kill anybody in close perimeter. But the concussion wave in our first attack in the World Trade Center in New York, people literally ran past EMS saying, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, and they said, we'll get to you, and they ran past them and they died because their organs were displaced from the concussion and they literally bled to death as they ran. So you're not gonna take blood pressures. In, in Oklahoma City, we had 150 car alarms going off at the same time. You're not gonna hear blood pressure, but you are gonna be able to observe the effects of the blast and you'll just know how to triage that person automatically. Heat. Heat's something we have to think about. Now, I go back to 1996, the Manchester incident. It's a good teaching point because they had 90 minutes warning that this bomb was gonna go off. And that's what gives us the visual teaching. At least 75,000 people were evacuated. They could have had many, many more casualties. And the size of the device they were, well, you, the other thing I want to point out is many of these events occur before or after major events because the terrorists know that you're going to have a lot of people in town. So they had telephoned this in, and so the helicopters could actually see where the bomb was. And it gives us a good visual of what to expect. That's what happens at the moment of detonation. Anybody in there is dead. It's outside that area where the pressure wave and where the shrapnel begins to hit. We've learned in Iraq and Afghanistan, they could take something as simple as a pickup truck, a couple of devices, artillery shells, and blow up a lot of people. Now, I would tell you, one of the easiest things to do is to kidnap, target an ambulance, 
fill it with explosives, and go in and pretend that you're one of the responders and do a secondary blast. So I teach people that in their ambulance they should have a laminated card with the ambulance's ID number, and when you know you're responding to a terrorist incident, you put that in the front windshield. The police and others then know that you're a secure ambulance. Because if somebody has stolen an ambulance, they're not going to know where that laminated card is sitting between the front seats. Small little thing, but it's important. It's going to happen. In our Columbine incident in Littleton, Colorado, they used gasoline and propane tanks near where the fire trucks and the EMS was going to park so they could also try and kill the responders. Now, the thing about a propane tank is when it explodes, it has a 200 to 1 ratio. That means if I put one propane tank in the middle of this room and I detonate it, I can consume you all in flames. So propane is extremely dangerous. That's what you'll see. That's what you'll see, people running away. And we also have terrorists that just throw smaller objects. So I'm talking about heat and burns here. And significant, the water gel product has just been uh, reinvented with new materials in it that is more adaptable to what the medical community likes. The thing I like about water gel is the facial water gel. It cools the burns, soothes the burns, and we, we don't do a good job of facial covering. Any port in a storm. You have to understand that patients are going to flee in all directions, and you have to factor on what those directions are. In Paris, you have to set up a team anywhere the police and fire are trying to bring victims out. So you're not just going to have one triage area. You have to have points of triage. At our Columbine incident, we ended up with 150 police cars with their doors locked that gummed up the area in our staging, so staging had to be a block and a half away. The other thing is natural instincts kick in. Where you see I have the, the uh, yellow rectangular, that's a security perimeter around the school. The kids aren't going to be able to run across the schoolyard and get out. They will flee the way they came to school. So you as a responder have to teach your responders, how did they come to school? Follow that path. Here, when they got out of the cafeteria that was under siege, they ran the way they came to school. Calls to our 911 call number said, there are children bleeding on my front lawn. Now, I show you this because this satellite photo shows you the way they ran to the only open area in that fence, which was a cul-de-sac, a roundabout in a neighborhood. And that's where they had to send resources to. So you have to know from some of your soft targets where you can anticipate a collection of patients. That same basketball net that you see here ends up with 11 critically shot patients. And everyone survived, thankfully. The other thing is identification. Your people who come from home, or nurses, or doctors, have to have some kind of a vest, even if it's something you buy on Amazon for $4. Because during a terrorist incident, if you're in civilian clothes, you're doing this, because the police don't know who you are. So if you're a doctor, you better have something that says doctor on, or you're going to stand like this for a long time before they, you get, they clear you to work in that scene. If you don't wear a vest, this sniper saw somebody, Harrison Klebold, wore, they were part of what they called the trench coat mafia, and they had bombs and things in their pockets, things called crickets, and they were in trench coats, and a fire officer came to the scene, and he was in dirty turnout gear from a fire simulation, and a sniper almost killed him because he saw him go on to land helicopters, but he didn't know he was going to land helicopters. He thought he was a trench coat mafia guy running across the field, and he got the order, uh, the, the sniper did, to take him out. It was only the grace of God and the fact that other ground officers made him hit the dirt, and we have the video from this, and he's pointing, I was landing a helicopter. They don't know that if you're not identified. Cattle shoot techniques work in corralling patients. We've tested this for many, many years. You put them from a large distance at your scene down to your triage point, and as people are running, it's amazing that they will follow those cones. Otherwise, they just run to the ambulance nearby. Tarps work. Tarp work as far as priorities. Patients come to the tarp. 
they get processed in the tarp, they come to an on-deck area like a baseball game or a football game, and off into the ambulances. You can see some of it here. If I come to that scene, I know that I have priority three patients. I don't have any ones or twos. If it gets too big on you, you can add extra yellow tarps, extra green tarps. You can mark the area with uh, chalk that that's now turned into a minor collection point. When things start to get out of control, you can use scene tape to add further definition to it, as you see here. You should have vests in those treatment areas to show who is the one person on that tarp who's in charge. So we throw that down wherever we have a treatment area and somebody has to wear that so we can find them in the middle of chaos because otherwise you have chaos about who's in control. San Bernardino, very important lesson. Husband, wife, team, terrorist. They go into the, school, the public building. They summarily kill a bunch of people. They leave a bomb behind. They're going to come back later and detonate that bomb. They're going to come back later to kill responders. Where do the responders go? Typically in a wide open area for triage. They're unprotected. They're unprotected. They're unprotected. They're unprotected. That's where they got literally blocks away from that scene as they were trying to come back is where they were gunned down and they were coming back to detonate those bombs. So number one lesson, law enforcement has to protect us in the treatment area. When we have terrorists attack, they can't abandon us. At this incident, they had protection and then when they heard that there was a gun battle going on, all the police jumped in their cars to go help. And if there are other terrorists coming back, they'd have killed all the responders and the patients. So you have to protect your people. You have to protect your people. You have to work with law enforcement to do that. Something very significant that we've been working on is we have a shooter, we have a shooter, how can we protect our responders? Well, watch the intro to the movie Saving Private Ryan. And what you're going to see there is that as they were trying to come in on shore during that battle, bullets were killing people in the water, but if you were eight feet away from a bullet when it hit the water with its density, it dies. And so we've tested this in labs, and what you find is this 223 round or something from an AK-47 fired into that left side, into that eight-foot water tank at full velocity, it's dead before it hits the other side. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because there's eight feet of water in every fire pumper and every fire brigade vehicle. So if I use those as shields to my treatment area during a terrorist attack, and I'll show you this, a bullet that hits that vehicle is going to stop before it goes to the other side and kills my responders. See it? And the backboards are used because if a bullet hits the ground and ricochets, it won't go underneath the truck. As silly as that may sound, that's enough to protect your responders. And we have to start thinking about this. This is on the inside area. And so you have a couple of paths. Um, you know, it's fine to have systems set up, but terrorist attacks like this are over in 60 seconds in many cases. They're over in less than five minutes, according to our FBI in the United States. So this is the threat side. You're going into the threat side, the first thing you have to think about is the protection. And then on the other side, you can set up your system rather quickly in less than five minutes. First is a fast track. He's bad, get him in an ambulance. He's bad, get him in an ambulance. He's bad, but not that bad, put him on the red tarp. She shot in the leg, yellow tarp. She shot in the ear, yep, green tarp. So you have a fast track. Once again, nighttime, we use a company called Fox Fury. They have a tube light that sets up in 10 seconds and can light up a football field. When you're working a nighttime incident, you can't wait for generators, you can't wait for inflatable lights. You have to set something up, push a button, drop the legs, open the LED panels, light up the scene. And this is a scene lit up that way. Patients are coming through, tarps are ready, 
Decision made right there by somebody, right to the ambulance. Not to the ambulance, to the tarp, to the tarp, to the tarp. So it's kind of a sub-triage thing that you have to think about and train your personnel because they get dormant. They think of a train accident, we have time, there's no threats. This is different, there are threats. Right into the ambulance. Again, another light, use of cones, responders know, load them at that loading zone for the ambulances. Tourniquets. Every police officer in America is being equipped with tourniquets. Every EMS unit is being equipped with at least four tourniquets. Because a bomb will take off two extremities, does you no good to have one tourniquet per ambulance. We had a crash in Reno, Nevada in the U.S. Five ambulances, five tourniquets. As soon as that crash at that competition hit, 15 amputations. What are you going to do? Dispatch extra ambulances for tourniquets? Since then, they're carrying four to five tourniquets apiece. Every officer carrying a tourniquet. Don't forget, you teach your officers, a tourniquet doesn't always have to be used as a tourniquet. It can be used to secure a, a, a prisoner's legs. It can be used to secure a bandage on a head. It's only a tourniquet when you twist it. The other time, it's just a good Velcro band. Okay. Now, we talk about this, how do we protect our responders? I don't know about you, but I'm not really keen on sending people into the hot zone. I'll send them into the warm zone with police officers in a specific way. We teach the diamond pattern. Law enforcement works with EMS on the diamond pattern, and that is that there's a police officer at the front, back, and each side, and a medic in the center. And they scuttle into a warm zone, get a patient, send the patient out. You'll see a couple examples here. Down the steps, the EMS responders are protected by the diamond. <clears throat> I want to show you this because I think this is the next incident. The next incident we're not prepared for is gas, biological things, other threats. We don't have our responders protected. The fire brigades are protected. In the United States, the current level of suicides is not by carbon monoxide. It's now chemicals that they buy in a pharmacy, mix in a bucket, and they kill themselves. And word spreads that this is a good way to kill yourself, and you don't want to kill responders, so many times there's a note saying, don't open this door. If a responder opens that door, they'll be critically asphyxiated or killed. And so we track this on internet sites. This little device doesn't require a fit test, can be carried underneath the front seat of any emergency vehicle, can be pulled on in a second. And when we get a job where somebody's going to see some people falling like canaries, we need to pull that hood on, just like the pilot in every plane that I fly has oxygen, and protects them from chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and carbon monoxide on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Thanks, AJ. Um, really insightful there into you know, the different things that are happening. So thanks to the two speakers. Um, I'd like to welcome on, Steve, on stage sorry, uh, Dr. Steve Hearns. Steve is uh, the clinical lead for the Scott Star Emergency Medical Retrieval Service. And Steve uh, set that service up himself. He's been a great advocate for um, thinking about how we look after ourselves. So we've heard a bit about our preparation for incidents. But uh, what happens when one, when one does happen? So I'd like you welcome on stage, yeah, Dr. Steve Hearns. Thank you. Good morning. Cheers, Paul. Uh, yeah, thank you, Paul. And thank you to the organisers uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, I want to talk to you for the next 25 minutes about this incident. On the 29th of November 2013, uh, the Scottish uh, police helicopter crashed into a crowded bar in the centre of Glasgow. This incident was really demanding for us as the, the emergency services in Glasgow from all three services, dealing with a, a large incident with multiple casualties, multiple fatalities, and particularly because the people in the helicopter were our colleagues. I want to divide my talk into four sections. 
initially put into a wee bit of context about our service, the Emergency Medical Retrieval Service in Scotland, and about, about the incident and how we responded to that, but really focusing on what happened in the days and weeks after that and what learning we had from that incident. So our service is funded by the National Health Service in, in Scotland and is part of the Scottish Ambulance Service. We're 100% consultant delivered service. We've got 28 consultants who work for us uh, and about a dozen paramedics and nurses. And we respond by helicopter, by plane and fast response car. And we've got five main roles in supporting healthcare in Scotland. We provide the pre-hospital critical care response to scenes of, of major trauma. In Scotland, we've got 24 small rural hospitals where bypass is impossible, but they are not able to provide definitive care to patients with critical illness and injury. And our job is to fly out there by helicopter or by plane, resuscitate and stabilise those patients and take them to definitive care. We also have the role of providing the medical response to major incidents in the west of the country and in rural areas. And in addition to that, we provide a telemedicine service to rural colleagues, and we provide outreach uh, training to, to people in rural areas as well. And we pride ourselves uh, on our governance and our professional appearance. That's my only funny slide, maybe they laughed. So, this incident. At the time we were co-located, our ambulance helicopter was co-located with the police helicopter at the same base uh, near the Clyde in, in Glasgow. Both aircraft were supplied by Bond Air Services. The pilots worked on both helicopters and the engineers at the base worked on both helicopters. And in the base every day there were the pilots, engineers, doctors, uh, paramedics and police officers. On the 29th of November, the helicopter, the, the night shift started and they were tasked to an incident on the east side of the country near Edinburgh. Flying the aircraft that night was Captain Dave Trail, a friend of mine who was engaged to be married to one of my consultant colleagues uh, and a, a lady who was one of our first uh, registrars. He was a superb pilot. He was a former Royal Air Force Special Forces Chinook pilot. He was a helicopter instructor, and also he was an RAF Chinook display pilot. They don't allow you to do loop the loop in one of those things unless you are the best. Also on board the aircraft that night was uh, Police Constable Kirsty Nellis and Police Constable Tony Collins. The aircraft lifted at 2045 and flew to uh, an area called Dalkeith and arrived overhead the incident at 2125. They were stood down from that quite quickly and tried to make their way back to Glasgow. On the way back they were asked to look at another incident just south of Glasgow and then made their way back towards the, the helipad. Unfortunately at 22, 22 hours the aircraft was lost on radar, there was no mayday call uh, and the aircraft, uh, both uh, engines stopped and it landed on the top of the Clutha Bar in Glasgow. There were 200 people uh, in the bar that night uh, watching a band. In addition to the three people on the aircraft who died, seven people in the pub died, and there were about three dozen people who were injured. As I say, the incident was near the centre of Glasgow uh, and adjacent to the River Clyde, which runs through the centre of the city. Now, the initial response to that, similar to what my uh, colleagues have been saying earlier, the initial response to that was actually by bystanders, uninjured people in the pub, providing first aid, dragging people out. And the emergency services were actually really quick to respond because of the location of the incident in terms of police, fire service and e EMS. Now, really important for me, what I found out during the debrief, was it wasn't the specialist operations response team, our major incident uh, response team as part of the ambulance service, who were in there dragging people out and treating them. It was standard paramedics and technicians without specialist major incident training or urban search and rescue training who were actually in that building initially uh, getting people out, and I'll come back to that. 
Post 9-11, the Scottish Government invested a considerable amount of money in a special operations response team, and they did arrive and they did manage the scene very well, but only after all of the casualties uh, had been removed. Hospital treatment of these patients was actually relatively straightforward. There were five large teaching hospitals within five kilometres of the site, so transporting patients to the hospital was quite quick. We had a problem, though, in terms of triage to definitive care, that patients weren't taken to the hospital, say that had neurosurgery, uh, plastic surgery and, and burns, and some required secondary transfers. Our own response is the retrieval service. We had two teams on call, uh, and they were on call from home that night. Our duty one team was actually in the far north of the country on a fixed wing retrieval. Our duty two team was tasked about 10 minutes later, and the rest of the team tasked uh, shortly after that. And our base uh, was actually only about three kilometers from the site. What was difficult, though, was that we had to come in from home and go to the helipad in order to get our equipment, get vehicles. And already at that time, uh, off-duty police officers from the aircraft and off-duty pilots were there. Uh, and you can imagine what the atmosphere was like, because they knew that obviously something really serious has happened, and there was a high chance that their colleagues were dead. We've got a team of about 40 people. Um, this is our major incident board from the night. We got about 10 guys to scene. We had another eight on standby at the base, and we had another 10 uh, uh, on call from home who were available to, to respond. When we arrived, the scene was actually very well managed. There was a senior ambulance uh, manager there who was known to us. The um, scene was, uh, as I say, quite, quite organized. I arrived probably 10 minutes after uh, the first team had got there, and they'd been involved in the initial uh, triage of some patients, but at that point, uh, there was no one that we needed to treat. And I have to say, there was stasis at that point, and for understandable reasons. The psychological impact um, of the, the whole scene, of seeing that aircraft that most of us had actually flown in as, as well, um, when our helicopter ambulance wasn't available, sometimes we would travel in that police helicopter and knowing that our colleagues and friends were actually in that building. And that's where our training, our stand, uh, standard operating procedures, checklists, uh, et cetera, came into play. We've got our own um, EMRS app with all of our clinical guidelines, all of our checklists, and that was actually absolutely invaluable to get out our major incident standard operating procedure, get out action cards, and I remember actually giving those and delegating roles to every member of the team and at that point, everyone switched on and realized exactly what their, their role was and followed the action cards, despite how emotionally and psychologically overwhelming uh, the scene was. Working with the Special Operations Response Team, we set up a casualty clearing station, and we had, um, within about 15 minutes, established six bays equipped for emergency anesthesia uh, and blood transfusion. At that point, we realized, however, that Special Operations Response Team stretchers were equipped to be on the ground. We'd never actually done any joint training with them, believe it or not, and it was just that is not the right position to provide a high level of medical care. Round about midnight, the fire service decided that it was actually safe for some of us to enter the building. They were obviously concerned about the stability of the aircraft, the uh, structural integrity of the building. There was the fire risk with fuel on the aircraft, and also there was asbestos as well. I, at that point, was the forward medical incident officer, and my colleague and I, Alistair Corfield, um, made ready to enter the building along with five paramedics. I stood at the bottom of that ladder, and I actually decided not to go into the building. By that stage, the fire service had reported that they thought that the occupants of the building and the helicopter were dead, and they were really just wanting me in particular to go in and confirm that. And I thought the physical risk to myself and Alistair was too great, but also the psychological risk of, of seeing uh, my colleagues in the aircraft. So five paramedics went into the building, um, and we stood by. Um, <clears throat> obviously, if they were alive, and then we were going to enter at that point. But they quite quickly... Um, pronounced life extinct. 
by about 1 a.m. we knew that there was no one else alive in the building and we actually stood the major incident down um, and I and Alistair remained on scene uh, for the rest of the night and we maintained a team there the next day more for protection uh, and safety of the, the firefighters who were involved uh, in the recovery of the aircraft uh, and the bodies. So later, I remember probably about three o'clock in the morning getting out a bit of paper and writing down what I thought was going to happen and what I would need to do over the next day. And I come up with three priorities. I've still got the bit of paper. Thinking about the well-being of, of my team, uh, my colleagues, trying to maintain business continuity, especially with regard to remote retrieval that our colleagues are absolutely dependent on uh, our service for, and also learning uh, as an organization and, and as a team. As far as learning is concerned, we did not have a hot debrief. It's mandatory when we get back from every job um, to debrief what happened clinically, communication-wise, TRM-wise. Our guys got back to the base in the early hours of the morning, obviously clearly upset. The base was surrounded by media at that point, and there were a lot of bereaved pilots and police officers there. So our guys just dispersed and didn't actually debrief. We did meet up 24 hours later with the pilots, the engineers, police officers, etc., uh, for, a, for a drink, uh, which was really quite helpful. And again, over the next few weeks, we, we had regular uh, basically meetings in the pub to, to talk things over and, and uh, share how we, we felt about it. We had a cold debrief, which was externally facilitated about a week later, which was attended by just about every member of the retrieval service. And that was really um, hugely effective. We identified 50 different things that we needed to improve on and to, to change in terms of our response to uh, multiple casualty incidents. In terms of business continuity, we had already written as part of our SOPs, uh, an SOP telling us what to do if one of our aircraft was lost. Uh, and uh, our, our guys were injured. And also we had a business continuity plan, but that more dealt with if the base um, wasn't functional anymore, how would we still be able to respond? So for understandable reasons, we really didn't have a plan for dealing uh, like an incident like this. Now, the next day I got an email from a lady called Angela Lewis, um, who is a, an officer in the Royal Navy. When the weather's too bad for our helicopter to fly, the local Royal Navy search and rescue unit with a Sea King uh, came and helped us out. We had a great relationship with these guys. Unbeknownst to me, uh, Angela Lewis and our colleagues were trained in a process called TRIM, which is Trauma Risk Management, and that's been developed by the Royal Marines for basically mates and, and peer support uh, after traumatic events. So she offered uh, that for us, and we rented a hotel uh, the very next day, and, and six guys who we knew and we trusted from the Royal Navy, who worked in a similar aviation background to we did, came up and spoke to us as individuals, uh, and that was hugely effective. And the role of that trim process is to speak to somebody who you know, who understands what you do, and they'll give you a bit of support, but also identify if there's any early signs that you may develop um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Also in the days afterwards, we didn't really know the engineers that well. They obviously stayed in the hangar and repaired the aircraft, but you can imagine how they were feeling. They were beginning to suspect there was a possibility that something that they might have done wrong in terms of servicing or repairing that aircraft had caused the death of their colleagues and all the people in that pub. So they were uh, really not in a, in a great position. Business continuity was also very difficult because, for understandable reasons, they grounded uh, the ambulance helicopter. The pilots didn't feel like flying for 24 hours. And then over the next couple of weeks, Eurocopter actually grounded every EC-135 helicopter in the world. So we still had to maintain a service to those 24 rural hospitals. And again, luckily, we had the support of the Royal Navy with a different type of aircraft but that made trying to maintain our service very difficult. Also, my colleagues and their families were watching this on the news over the next few days. 
And people became understandably very anxious to the point of being fearful about getting in that helicopter again. So that aircraft was the same type of helicopter as us, maintained by the same engineers, with the same type of, of fuel in it, and no one actually knew what the cause of the crash was. And that become, became very difficult over the next few weeks when it came to someone having a shift, a flying shift, did they actually w want to fly? Um, there was lots of questions that they wanted that um, we as a service and, and me as the lead clinician didn't have answers to. And it got to the stage on two occasions where we actually had to have a backup doctor who would come in and start the shift at 7.30am with one of the consultants so that when the bell went, if they didn't um, want to go on that aircraft, then someone else would. That was extremely difficult. Media coverage uh, was huge. This was the only story for a, about a week uh, in the UK media, and the base uh, where the police the aircraft was, was uh, located and where we were located uh, was really under siege from the media for a full week. Also, the investigations into this were much more than I would have imagined. The Iraq's investigation branch actually took two years to look into this, but there was police interviews, there was interviews from these guys. One of the pilots was interviewed for 10 hours, and that was really, really pretty intrusive and, and pretty intensive. And then lots of VIPs wanted to come and visit the site, visit the base, and that's fantastic, but for, as a leader, that's really quite difficult. Trying to make sure that people who wanted to come and meet these guys got the opportunity to do that, no one's left out, but also people who really weren't interested in, in speaking to these people didn't feel forced uh, to do so. It was actually quite uh, time consuming for, uh, uh, to organise all of that. And then there were the funerals as well over the next uh, two weeks. So thinking about staff and well-being, and what did we learn from this? One was that our major incident call-out system didn't work. It was supposed to be a group text system from a hospital switchboard, and the person on duty didn't know how to do a group text, and she had to phone 40 people manually. So we've adapted our iPhone app, now our retrieval service app, that we can actually send out a, a, an alert to every member of the team using the app, which is a, a lot more effective and a lot faster. We've also revised our standard operating procedures uh, and our checklists to be a lot more pragmatic in light of the experience that we had. And we're much more familiar now with the equipment that the ambulance services uh, response teams carry and in doing joint training with them. And as I said, a lot of services, ambulance services, invest in specialist teams to respond to major incidents. But in our experience of having been involved probably in about 10 major incidents now, it's your standard paramedic and technician that does the bulk of the work before the specialist guys get there. So any inclination to potentially remove training, uh, equipment, etc., for those guys is probably the wrong thing to, to do. Um, don't invest all of your resources just in your special operations response team. Now, the other thing that we learned was that we invest thousands of pounds in personal protective equipment for all of our staff to keep them physically safe. And we invest lots of time in safety at scene training, helicopter underwater escape training. But in 13 years, thankfully, we've never had anyone seriously physically injured. But I've had one consultant and one paramedic who have been off sick because of psychological and emotional harm from the work that, that we do, uh, one of them for 18 months. So our guys were going through a number of emotions um, for a number of months after this. There was grief at losing their colleagues and friends. There was disappointment within our service that we couldn't actually do more to save some of those people at the scene. There was physical fatigue for really quite a long time. But a pride as well, emotionally, that we had managed to, to respond in the way we did. And as I say, there was anxiety and there was fear uh, about flying uh, on the aircraft. And it took really quite a long time in terms of reflection and processing that information. So secondary to that, what we've now done is we've worked with some psychologists, some specialist consultant trauma psychologists in Glasgow uh, to establish a well-being system for our staff. And that's got four stages. First stage is to actually provide training to all of our guys about what the symptoms are, 
after an event and how it's quite normal to ruminate on things, to have uh, trouble sleeping, etc. That's all quite normal as long as it just goes on for a finite amount of time. And then we've trained a number of our guys to be um, sort of well-being staff, i.e. they go through a three-day course and if someone has gone through a traumatic event, they are the people that we go and speak to. Again, they provide a bit of mate support, understanding the type of job that we do, and in the same way as Trim does, they identify if someone is at risk of developing a more serious uh, uh, psychological problem, and then we've got direct, rapid access to a consultant psychologist. The other learning point for anyone who's a leader of an EMS service or a, a pre-hospital service, Obviously, you need to think about how you're going to look after your people. They're much more important than any other part of your, your system. And then really, before this happens, have a plan as to how you're going to approach these types of events. And as soon as they happen, start planning what the next days and weeks are going to be like. Get trusted senior colleagues and delegate to them. The support that I had from a number of colleagues was absolutely invaluable and given responsibility for certain aspects of this uh, was, was hugely helpful. You've got to learn and you've got to be aware about how long you, this is going to take over your life for. Uh, this was probably uh, all I did for about a month after this event. And you've got to think about your own personal well-being and who's looking after you as the lead for the service whilst you're looking after your team. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for sharing. Um, can we get the other speakers just to come up very quickly? Um, so look after yourselves, look after your team. And then we'll be able to look after other people when, when bad things happen. So, um, some questions, Tim? Yeah. Um, well, let's open up to the floor. We don't have that much time uh, because I know some of you may be going for visits uh, which require going for the bus. But I'm sure there are burning questions because you have great experts over here. Chat there in the middle. Go ahead. If you want, you can shout it out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Too much singing and dancing last night. <laughs> so, um, talking of EMS personnel being hit, what do you think of a hospital as a soft target as well? So, do we have to take that into consideration? Yes. We have, in, in the NHS in, in England, uh, every hospital has to have a lockdown procedure. Um, uh, it's quite interesting, if you, if you go to the hospitals in Paris, although they have a lot of different buildings that make up their hospitals, most of their hospitals have got a perimeter wall and there's only one or two points of access or egress. Uh, my personal, uh, my hospital has 23 different doors you can get into the hospital. Thank you. Uh, a couple of points for the hospital. Um, you should have them have one person at their radio or the communications area consistently so the message gets relayed inside. And then a very uh, significant thing is that they have to be prepared that there could be a shooter or a terrorist that wants to come to the hospital, and so their security has to be really strong. And you don't want ambulances to go in the emergency department like you normally would on a call. Change your patients, change your equipment outside, and get back to the scene. And then, uh, you know, last but not least is you gotta make sure that you have the hospital staff familiar with your triage system, whatever you're using, I teach services the first day of every month should be triage day. And every patient, whether they have a splinter, a fracture, or a head injury, gets a tag because that's when the staff will say, what is this? And that's a teaching moment. You don't want to wait until you have a major incident to have people look at your tags and not understand what they are. Uh, yeah, because the, 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 the lesson from the Boston bombings was what works is not having a special plan for a major incident, it's just doing what you normally do, but doing more of it and quicker. Yeah. And interestingly, AJ and I were at the site, we were talking about the Bang, uh, Bangkok or the Thailand hospital bombing that happened just a few days ago. So, you know, it depends on your hospital as well, that um, like in, in Asia setting, many of them are not really uh, places where there's a lot of security and they tend to be very vulnerable because that's where your resources are to help. And picking up on AJ's point as well, the concept of the Trojan horse, 
Um, the SO5, which is the UK Counterterrorism Police, are very, very twitchy about responders' blue lights being stolen because uh, an, an anonymous vehicle with a blue light on turning up at a hospital will get a priority parking spot. Lady there in the middle. Yeah, I just uh, have a comment. Um, there's um, been a PhD study and created a website, an international website called majorincidentsreporting.net. Uh, have you heard of it and considering using it? As I have understood, the uh, background so is trying to gather uh, information from major incidents to do research. So this is the guys from Linchipping. Pardon? Is is this the website set up by the guys from Linköping? Uh, no, it's from Norwegians. Uh, I think uh, the main, um, uh, main person behind it is Sabina Fatta. Yeah, it's yeah. the guys from Linköping. Yeah, okay. yes, yes, I have heard of it, yes. And, and I have not, but I'd love to learn more about it. Okay. So one final question. I think we've got a chat over here on the left. Mike yeah, um, left, do you like? firstly, I'd just like to thank Dr. Hearns for what was clearly a very informative and also a very personal account, so uh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, you had touched on trim, and it's something I've personally experienced, trim. Um, and do you feel, from the experience that you had from the Navy officers coming down and supporting you the day after, that should be mandatory for ambulance personnel, considering we do things like extinguisher training and other things every year? Do you think something as important as trim should be more widespread and available to emergency medical services? Yes, and... After Clutha, um, a group was set up within the Scottish Ambulance Service and there, there are plans uh, to provide um, training to a large number of people and uh, provide access to that for the whole, the whole service. Absolutely, it was, it was hugely helpful. Uh, it really was. And we have it embedded in EMAS as well. And um, I'm working with uh, 13 different large organizations throughout North America and uh, other countries to... Um, on something we call the Alliance on EMS Resiliency. And the goal is that uh, people offline or online can get some help and uh, follow a computer program and get resiliency training because they don't know that they're stressed and they don't know that they're after stressed. And sometimes it's better if they can do that in the privacy of their home and they don't have to admit to somebody that they're feeling that. So it's, it's to, to condition people for what we have to see, like the poor folks in Manchester, they'll be residual effects of that for years. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I think you'll uh, agree, you know, a really non knowledgeable uh, faculty for that session and, you know, sharing those personal accounts, something we should take note of. So I'd like you to uh, show your appreciation one more time in the usual way. So guys, um, a few of you have got visits, etc. I think, to different things um, or to lunch and then back into your afternoon sessions. The patient safety, patient safety session in here is going to be excellent. So come back and go and listen to some other stuff about flying drones if you want to. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks,